So I want to do a painting of a couple of explorers trying to find magical creatures in the wilderness. Um, but they're just wizards fresh out of school and they don't know what they're doing in the wilderness at all. And I found this lovely reference photo of kind of a whitewater bit of a stream between some trees. So I thought I would sort of block that in and then maybe get some figures blocked in and take it from there. I don't know how I'm going to do at painting rushing water, but uh, it's worth a try. All right. So the challenge with this is I really need to like commit to a perspective. Yeah. Direction that the water is flowing. Do I see sort of going like this and then like this and then like this? I like this. We're gonna need some figures. Just some poses. So I'm just doing a quick search through my reference for poses at the appropriate angle that feel, you know, relevant. I start my ref in a few different ways I have just landscapes, right? Just like lots of beautiful landscapes. And then I have figures, right? Obviously, you want to know how to draw people. So then I have multi-figure compositions where people are interacting. And then I have scenes where the figures and the landscape are really important together. And, you know, not necessarily a landscape, just an environment. And that's, uh, you know, like... <laughs> A lot? Okay. I do, I found some really lovely photos of people camping, like vintage camping photos. And I feel like they just don't have, I mean, when, when you look up like backpacking on Instagram, you get the same. Everybody's doing a Krieg off. It's like a person with a landscape in front of them and they're back to the, to the camera. And that's, it's not what I'm going for here. It's a great way to take a travel photo. It's not the kind of illustration I want to make. So I like this um, idea of finding these other travel photos, camping photos, hiking photos from eras before everybody wanted to do a Krieg off, before we kind of codified everything with Instagram. So I'm just getting some figures in and I'm doing this in a watercolor pencil crayon. This is an Albrecht Durer brand. This is Earth Green Grunard. Um, it's going to just sort of like sink into the page. Now I've done this with watercolor projects and the line work can still be very visible um, depending on how I paint. But 
this is gouache I'm going to use, so I'm not really worried about the line work all that much. And I really love this person who's like, there's a, in the ref, there's somebody who's like lying, drinking water out of a river and, or a stream or a tiny creek. I can't see anything except the bank of it. It's really cute. It's a cute pose. I feel like it makes sense for a cute travel photo. And by photo, I mean painting. So I'm going to get these poses drawn in. I'm not going to have this person drinking, they're just going to be looking, but I feel like we can have some fun with that. Just sort of on a rock sticking out of a swirling river. You know, they make good decisions, these traveling, these traveling adventures. They've definitely been in the wilderness before. They've never been in the wilderness before. Okay, so I feel like these are pretty reasonable pencils. I'm going to take five, five seconds, and I will be right back. I'm just going to tell the internet I'm doing this because I feel like they don't know. And that's fine. Um, but just wait. Told the internet this is happening. They have all the info they need. Okay, so I've got my poses, I've got my figures, I've got some empty space. That's my core thing. The other piece that was missing here is the actual creature. And so I've also got obviously reference of animals. I love drawing animals. I don't intend to draw a real animal. Um but I was looking at diving birds. Those are really cool. A little bit too intense, I think, in terms of motion for this one. So what could be in the river? I already did eels. I already did giant flying eel dragons. I love eel dragons, I guess. It's just a thing I like. Ooh, iguanas are good. Marine iguanas are good. Look at those mean boys. I also have a lot of drawings of moose and reference photos of moose, but I don't know if that's quite right for this situation. <laughs> Probably gonna go with a betta style creature. So, you know, when I was a little kid, we didn't know what the science name was and we called them Siamese fighting fish. That's 
that's like a beautiful creature. You know? Just like unbelievably gorgeous. What if it was bigger and sturdier? Also, they have really grumpy faces, which I believe we can all agree is hilarious. And they can breathe a little bit of air. So they actually live in, in fairly still water zones, wetlands. And so when oxygen in the water is low, they can actually go and process a little bit from the air. Uh, I don't think it's an ideal long-term solution for them, but, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to sort of treat their top fins like uh, shark fins sticking out of the water. So I thought that would be neat. And what can I add to like make them magical? I mean, they're magical looking creatures and if they're bigger, that's already pretty neat, but what could I bring to this that would sort of make them notable? Hmm. And I guess they could just be longer. I love, I love a dragon. <laughs> They're all dragons in this series. Everything is a dragon. like tuck something around in this corner. Now the trouble with gouache is that it's really easy to lose all your lines underneath your first set of layers. So it's likely I'm going to do that. Stay focused. Sorry for the camera bobs. So yeah it's it's likely I'm going to lose some of the gouache. Uh -huh. Okay, the beautiful betta fish dragons. I'm gonna make their mouths wider too. So if you hear any grumping, that's my dog. Let's go back over to our scenes. Sorry, our landscapes. Just figure out this. So we have sort of a river going down a hill here. So what can I do over here to sort of show that things are receding down this hill? Maybe some sort of other types of tree trot tops sticking out. I really love spruce. They have wonderful silhouettes. You know, they kind of have these droopy, scoopy branches. All right. Let's put some firm decisions on our characters for a minimum. Maybe also our fish. I've been looking up costumes that I feel are wizardy, and wizards are something... Oh, my dog is, like, right beside my foot. If I, like, shift, I'm gonna step on it. Good call, buddy. Yeah, so wizards are... I mean, if you look at... Um, sort of the history of, of fantasy art, we end up with these wizards that are very much uh, Eastern European medieval clothing, uh sort of Middle Eastern, Central Asian medieval clothing. Um, and there's reasons for that that aren't great. Um, but there are also some really cool clothes from then. So I was looking at 12th to 14th century 
sort of Central Asian northern fashion and it's it's kind of hard to be certain that I'm being accurate because I'm not actually trying to be accurate is maybe the important thing I'm trying to be inspired and also like folk folk patterns in clothing you know really incredible sort of patterning and so forth so you kind of figure these are two wizards they're probably fresh out of school I don't really know what they've been up to um they're probably fairly well off if they're having like a gap year going out trying to find cool things in nature that are magical so we'll give them a bit of an absurd outfit um in terms of like this is maybe a little too fancy to wear camping because I feel like that's just very wizardy so yeah I found this these outfits with just like incredible sleeves like sleeves that are optional so Not a lot of high collars in this era. High collars are pretty fun. I think we can all agree. A lot of like split collars that you can swing up almost like a hood. Which makes a lot of sense in the wilderness. Yeah, I feel like if they are exploring a stream, they are probably not. wearing all of their winter clothes. This pose is hard. This pose is a little cramped, but we'll make it work with this pose. Oof. You wear under your really cool coat. Nobody knows. I don't have any records thereof. That's fine. Go with some bare feet. I also do have a kneaded eraser. I'm going to lighten these a little bit.
what would you dribble in the water to attract a beta fish dragon? <laughs> Jewelry. Well, that's not bad. Alrighty. I actually don't want to lighten these too much. I'm going to spritz it lightly so they don't move around too much. You can see the water hitting the color, eh? Just gets a lot darker. They might run a bit, but that's fine. Also means sort of prepping the page to take paint. This is 100% cotton fluid brand hot press watercolor paper. I think it's just 140 pound. It's been a little frustrating to use with watercolor only because every edge of every brush stroke is visible. It's really hard to get soft edges. But it works like a treat with gouache. So I've got a set of brushes, big one, big one, medium one. This one is a good point, though I'm sure it's not as clear when it's wet, but uh, and these are all, sorry, I've got fixed focus on here, which is not bad. So definitely not going to be using the small ones for the first chunk of the painting, so those away. I've got a little brush stand on the back of one of my painting tools, which is nice. Just sliding all over the place. I'm going to just blot off any really wet bits. Something's rattling, but I can't tell you what. We'll never know. It's just rattle life. Sorry, I'm fiddling. Ah, that's the literal table. All right, table, you do you. This has got to be pretty dry, though. So, this is my gouache set. Uh, I've seen a few different people using them. A little silicone seal and it's a travel set so you can just mix your paint on this but uh, the appeal of it is that it keeps the gouache itself very wet and so far no mold I'm sure mold is a risk um, but uh, until then so it's a little gross but that's fine just put that to one side and we can start thinking about colors So this gouache set also comes with a oops, ex 
expand up a little water dish. Dropping my brushes out the back. So I've got that and a couple other water dishes. Because you can honestly never have too many water dishes with gouache. It's really a very water heavy tool to use. Not that you want anything to be wet, because you don't. What you want is for the gouache to get off the brush quickly and, and simply. So I've been experimenting with different sort of dollar store cloths, some tea cloths, some microfiber cloths. Some of them work better than others. I actually am really liking these microfiber cloths in particular. Might get some more. It's nice to have a good stack of them though because they are going to get really wet and having cloths underneath pulls the water out of the one on top a little bit better. So I have this brush and I sit it on a cloth. This one gets the water out of it uh, about the fastest. None of them really compare to stuff like uh, pencil crayon, but uh, they are better than nothing. So I'm just going in and sort of wetting everything but the figures. So I made a mixing chart of this squash set, which I like doing. And this is a great thing to look at and sort of be like, what, what do I want color-wise? And there's some really lovely sort of yellows up in this zone. I really like the sort of the Naples yellow it does interesting things with the colors as a pastel option. And then there are just some incredible sort of blue greens available. The phthalo blue mixes really nicely with the browns. But then if I want like a rich green, I want to use the Windsor green. And there's some really nice dark ones like Windsor green and Windsor and Crimson, Windsor green and Spectrum Violet. The primary red, I didn't get as bright a color. It's probably because it's redder. I don't really know. But yeah, then primary red and Windsor green. It's still a really nice muted purple. So I feel like creams and purples are like two colors I want to have. I do think they make things feel magical. Cream and purple and teal. Cream and purple and teal. And we need kind of a brownie red, so something up in here. So that's helpful for me. I sometimes have a really clear vision of exactly what kind of colors. Sometimes I don't have any idea and I have a ton of color comps. This is an awesome sort of in-between solution. So yeah, just sealing in all of the scenery, line work, water. So one of the things about gouache is that there's a distinct difference between gouache that you dilute and let sink into the page a la watercolor and gouache that you layer and lighten with white. And there's ways to plan it so that that vibrant distant color can be popped out still, you know? And there's ways not to. Okay, so if I know I like teal, then what I'm probably going to do is wash some teal in the background. So I actually have teal blue paint for now. Um, <laughs> I use the end of my tube in this little square here. It's uh, unfortunately unlikely to be a paint that I replace. I'm just, it's very opaque. Um, and I want to try something that's more intentionally a pastel, you know? But 
I have enjoyed it while I've had it. And who knows, I might have replace it. Okay, so we have this zone behind the character that is in the distance behind this hill that the stream is on. We can kind of sink the paint in a bit. Get it behind this foreground tree. And that's very pretty. So then things that are nearer, I would like to warm up. So let's get a little Naples yellow into this teal. That gets us something that's just a little bit less saturated, a little bit warmer, coming into the green zone, but not kind of like a delicate mint. You can sort of see my mixing thing over here. I could probably move mine closer. So yeah, nice sort of delicate mint. Again, we're gonna dilute the heck out of it. Get some of these nearby trees. Now you notice the water's running down. I've got my page on an angle. That's, it's kind of a, 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 a bit of a, a way to hold myself accountable for not using, when I start mixing lots of gouache into more opaque layers, if it's running down the page, it's not. I've made the wrong choice in my, how much I put on my brush, how much water I'm using, etc. So you can see I'm keeping those colors pretty undersaturated. And then for the stream, I'm going to take a little bit of that teal blue again. I'm going to mix it with some browns. Actually, aren't my browns. Let's go with burnt sienna. It's this guy right here. Already got some teal blue in it, so why don't we take that contaminated chunk? It's a great starting point. Already mixing. And this gives us kind of a darker version of that color that I mixed in as a mint. It becomes kind of a almost like an army green. And we can start to lay this in on the water. A few spots where you might be able to see into the water. Let's dilute that a little bit more. There's going to be a lot of other stuff going on in the water. Foam and reflected light and also our little dragon creatures and so forth. So this isn't, the water isn't all going to be this color, but it makes sense to me as an undercoat on the water. We're already losing our little dragons, but I can probably remember what they look like. And I'm going to just start to bleed in some of that teal as the water gets farther down that hill. And then I'm going to mix one with just a little bit more burnt sienna for as the water gets closer to the viewer just to deal with that kind of Fresnel effect where you can see into the water instead of off the water when you are at a closer more vertical angle viewing it. It's a it's a neat effect that I like a lot. So you can see what I mean with watercolor this approach of like the paper just doesn't get wet kind of hard to keep it damp enough to sort of absorb and create gentle gradients and such. So that's the challenge. Okay, so then the other color we have is the rocks and then the figures. I'm just gonna scoop off some of this excess that's dripping down here. So like I said, this isn't that I want a ton of the 
really intelligently placed gradients or anything here. I'm just looking for something that I'm gonna put a little bit of that watercolor up into the nearby trees. That's a nice trick. I want something that's going to create interesting texture behind and between my brush strokes. So like all of these blooms and drips and stuff, I'm not really that worried. It's going to be fine. I'm just sort of creating complexity, almost. Okay, a little bit with this. Teal again. All right, well, those are very harmonious colors, but what are we gonna do for the rocks? Sorry if it's squeaking noise, I'm cleaning my big flat ceramic plate that I use as a gouache palette. It's great noise, everybody loves it. I did really like that Viridian Green and Primary Red. Primary Red is really purpley. Good color when we get into the magic part of things. It's very pink. So other things I can mix with it, I've got sort of my range of purples, oranges, greens. So when we look at sort of burnt sienna, we're getting some really fun, like, very orangey colors. But let's try burnt sienna with a couple of different things. Because burnt sienna and viridian make an absolutely lovely. Ever so slightly orangey brown. It's still pretty saturated, but it's a good start. And then burnt sienna and primary red make a very bright orange. So those two colors will be good light washes to go underneath my rocks. Oh, and I want to just suck up some of the extra color that's landing on my character. Kind of wash that in. I guess I gotta set up chat rules. Dog snores. Catch the worst of the drips. up some darker maroony browns and that can also come in with a little bit of that yellow ochre mix up some slightly cooler colors for the background rocks
Well, I'm making a mess, friends. <laughs> I like gouache. It's generally a pretty ugly experience until it's pretty much done. I think it teaches me an enormous amount of humility as a painter. I mean, you can put down a couple of watercolor washes and just be like, wow, paint is beautiful. My art is beautiful. I'm a genius. But you can put down some... It just looks terrible. <laughs> but I can see the potential, right? And that's, that's, I think, a lot of the work that I do these days is trying to remind myself that, like, this artwork has potential. Okay, so... I'm gonna take my teal. Got a lot of that. I wanna mix up something a little bit closer to a sort of more royal blue. So what I'm gonna do is sort of very slowly start to mix in just a little bit of this primary red to get something that's, I guess, more of a periwinkle. And that was a color I really wanted to use for characters. So let's wash on some periwinkle. That's pretty fun. And again, I'm going to mix up brown on the darker end for some of the fur highlights on their clothes. We'll just do some yellow ochre and primary red and burnt sienna. Get something a little closer to it's not a yellow, right? You don't have a yellow in this palette right now. If I need one, I'll add one, but something a little closer to a brown. For this little blonde character. For shoes. And the rest of this one's outfit. More of that mint. I liked it. I feel like I could get away with it as an underpainting for anything that I want to be white. I like that periwinkle. I've been trying to pick a color that would be likely to stand out in most different environments I'm going to paint these two in. Um, Periwinkle is a good call. I'm going to just do a swatch of it for myself. Hold on to that thought. They make periwinkle paints. I just haven't bought one. You might also call it lavender or lilac. It's that. It's a very light line between violet and, and blue. So... decide if I should put an underpainting on these fish or if they should be shining just through the murky water. Do you think that might be the best bet? Okay. The other thing I want to do is get an underpainting on Character's skin attempts to mix purple bar going badly. <laughs> I picked you so I could mix purples. There we go.
Okay, I've made a big mess and everything's wet, so it's probably time to stop painting for a bit. So I'm going to call it here on this one. And thank you if you tuned in or if you're watching this later. I uh, like painting. It's nice to share it with people. See ya.